split this up into short stories, very short stories. Because in my experience, a, even a boring short story is often better than an interesting fact or bullet point. So, um, but first, just uh, we have to get some definitions out there. Well, one definition. So, there's a lot of ways to define this, but uh, there's some growing consensus. Consensus may be too strong a word is that at least in the eastern Massachusetts climate, which is a little bit warmer than what you have up here, uh, eastern Massachusetts is about 5,500 to 6,000 heating degree days. I think up here it's seven to 8,000. So this is what you aim for. In fact, there's a national grid incentive program in eastern Massachusetts, and those are the prescriptive requirements for the program for qualifying. And uh, basically what it means is taking a house, stripping the siding, wrapping it in insulation, and putting the siding back on. And there's more to it than that, and I'll get into the details, but it's really a comprehensive re-engineering of an existing structure to try to get the total energy um, way, way low. And in my part of uh, New England, eastern Massachusetts, it's not unusual for 75 to 80 percent of the total energy usage of a house to be for heating. So deep energy, so that's your leverage point. If you can cut that dramatically, then you're, you're cutting the total energy usage dramatically, obviously. So that's, that's where all the insulation comes in. So anyway, story number one. I've been a bottom contractor for almost 30 years. Uh, for half that time, I've liked to think of myself as a green, you know, environmentally concerned remodeling contractor. And these are the sorts of projects we've done in the past. Every single one of these three projects increased the total resource consumption of that house, <laughs> some by a considerable margin. That one over there, the brick one, we increased the, uh, had to increase the service, the service from uh, 100 amps to 400 amps. We increased the square footage from 4,500 square feet to 6,000 square feet. Uh, we put uh, a brick veneer in the addition to match, not only to match the, the old brick that was there, but also to make sure that it was really, really hard for anybody in the future to add any more insulation to the outside. <laughs> So um, I, won't, I won't go through all of them, but it was after that project in particular that my crew basically sat me down and said, um, what, what are we doing? You know, you're, you're calling yourself green. You're, you're the biggest fraud in the area. They didn't use the word fraud because I still signed the pay paychecks, but um, <laughs> what the... Uh, what I realized is that we are basically part of the problem. Those houses, those projects were really well designed, really well built, and there's going to be no reason to change any of them significantly for 50, 60, 70 years. So we missed our chance with those. We've locked in the performance of those projects for a long, long time. What we are doing now, this year, is going to have a service life of a half century or more, hopefully more if we know what we're doing. Therefore, we're determining now, this year, what our resource consumption is going to be in the year 2050. In the year 2050, we're supposed to have reduced greenhouse gas emissions by 80%. Um, I know I see very, very few projects, remodeling projects, that reduce the resource consumption of those homes, uh, re reduce the greenhouse gas emissions of those homes by 80%. But the fact is, what we do in 2011 is what's going to be there in 2050, more or less. So, uh, things don't look so good for 2050. We're really the first industry, the, by industry I mean profession, the design, the architecture construction profession right now. We're, we're in some ways, we're the first profession or industry that has to um, force our clients to make hard choices. 
you know, cars, you can buy a crappy car now, then it's okay because in 10 years you can buy a good car. Uh, same with refrigerators. Refrigerators are improving, you know, by the, by the year. So you buy a, an energy hog of a refrigerator now, in 15 years you'll be able to upgrade it. So we, we've got some time with most things. With houses, we don't have time. We're either solving the problem now or we're um, conceding failure. And when I did my house, I did my house before I had drunk the Kool-Aid. I started the Kool-Aid. I was basically in my fraud years is when I did my house. So we, you know, we did we did some good things. We used icing. That was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> You'll understand it better. But basically, this was my approach to reducing my resource consumption at my house. I had no particular goal in mind before anything I did was going to be just fine. So when we finished the house, and I realized, hey, this is using a lot of energy, uh, we started taking action. And actually, this trend line continues downward. This is just electrical usage. This is a rolling average. Each of these data points is the previous 12 months divided by 12. So it's automatically seasonally adjusted. Right about, uh, right about there is when my older daughter went off to college. <laughs> And it didn't move the line, it didn't, it didn't change things as much as I thought. But if our, the food does have gone way down. <laughs> um, my, uh, we, we have a steady decline until uh, about a year ago when my wife started making bread at home in our electric oven. And so now it's creeping up <clears throat> again, but I really like the bread. So I haven't told her yet. <laughs> so anyway, we've been able to make a, a serious dent in the electrical usage, but look at the total energy usage line. So this is heating, cooling, electrical. This is just, well, I mean, this is, this is just electrical, so it includes cooling. This is everything. So heating is added. Not as, not as, uh, not as happy. So moral of this story, at my own house, it's easy to change occupant behavior up to a point. Uh, it's a lot more difficult to change the behavior of your building envelope. So that, that beautiful renovation I did on my house, which trust me, we're not about to do again anytime soon, regardless of what I've learned since then, is, is what we're stuck with. So our only dial to turn is occupant behavior. We, we've done the major exterior renovation. We're not about to retrofit. So we missed our chance for a good 50 years. And this is what deep energy retrofits are about. So, I start discovering data, which we're not really very good at in the design and construction industry. So, we started doing uh, an operational rating, because it was easy on our projects. Um, you know, it's not super nuanced, it's sort of a blunt instrument. But, we don't use much wood down the down where I live, so I left that out, but you can put wood in if you want. Add it all up, divide by the square footage of the living space, and you get something called BTU per square foot per year. It's, uh, as I say, it's crude but effective. Uh, and this is what happened when I plotted that information. So this is the number of houses on the vertical scale in the data set, and then I've got uh, BTU per square foot per year coming across, and these are these are in like 5,000 BTU per square foot per year bins. So there's 25 that are right at about 60k BTU per square foot per year. There's a few outliers out here. Uh, there's a really good one there, which is actually um, actually one of these two is a is a pretty leaky. It's an 1870 house in Jamaica Plain suburb of Boston, or neighborhood of Boston. So I went there and looked at it, as, as I say, it was perfectly ordinary, except that the homeowners turned the heat down to 50 when they were away or at night, and cranked it all the way up to 56 when they were at home. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, this is the distribution. You notice it's, there's a drop off at 60. This is where the current price of energy gets us, basically. You know, a house in my, in my neck of the woods that's at 60,000 is a it's a house that has an 80% efficient boiler or furnace that has mediocre insulation. Nobody's done some any strategic air sealing. And the homeowners don't really pay attention. So it doesn't have a thoughtful owner, careful owner. 
doesn't have particularly good info. So in order for us to get to, well, let me, I'm jumping ahead here a little bit. So it's easy to get to 60. That's where the market gets us. Um, you can get to 40 or less with careful behavior without spending much money at all, just by being aware. But by my calculations, to, uh, two things are going to happen between now and 2051. There's more low carbon energy is going to come online. So we'll be using more and more of that in our houses, which is going to reduce the demand for efficiency a little bit. But we're going to have to make up the difference with efficiency. So by my calculations, we're going to have to improve the efficiency from a median in my data set of about 75 kBTU to around 25 k or so. So a significant drop, which we can't do just with behavior changes. So many houses will have to be deep energy retrofits. So that's what I learned from my data collecting story. It's empowering to have real data, even if the data is depressing. Because now, now I know what we have to do. I can put a number to it. I'm not just like the Cheshire Cat. Any rule that is there. I have some real information. All right. Passive House. 2008, I had a chance to take a Passive House training class in Urbana, Illinois. I heard Katrine Klingenberg speak at the Affordable Comfort Conference in Pittsburgh that year and was really intrigued by what she had to say. So I signed up for the training class. Um, in fact, if you go to their website, there's a picture of the very first, first class. And that's me. That's <laughs> <laughs> where the basketball is usually. Because you know, I was, I was the most basketball-like person there. So the Passive House standard, for those of you who don't know, it is really simple. Don't think lead with all the points and the hoo-ha and the this and the that. It's three things. Um, it's an airtight, it's a total energy <coughs> standard. How much energy can the house use per square foot? Which is, uh, it's uh, how much can it use, how much of that can be for heating and cooling? Which is a little more, it's like 15% of the total energy can be for heating and cooling. And then it's an airtightness standard. And so that's it. This is, there's this massive spreadsheet, and you know if you've met the standard by whether you have yeses in these two boxes. So it's really simple. What's, in, in some ways, some people think it's too simple. But, but uh, what I really like about it is that it gives us a target. This, these were the first people I heard talking about energy usage, about how much energy a building should use. Um, which was revelatory to me, because I've you know, been in the environmental building business for quite a while, and I never heard anybody say, for a building to be successful, it should use this much energy and no more. And that was fascinating to me. So, since the introduction of the standard in the United States, there's been a lot of debate about it. And, and I like the debate. I think it's the right, finally we're asking the right questions. On, on a large scale. I mean, there have always been people asking the right questions, in, in particular in this part of Vermont. But um, my lesson, the lesson I pulled out, it's good to have a defensible target. It's good to have a goal in mind. It's not like the Cheshire Cat. It's good to know where you're going. Um, but it's also important to consider that target a hypothesis rather than a conclusion, because otherwise, uh, People get really ideological and stubborn and adamant and say stupid things and, and things that aren't true because they bought into this, they've taken this arbitrary standard and made it the gospel. And I think that's dangerous because it limits the number of tools we have in the box. So um, I've developed a hypothesis about what I think our project should use in total energy. And I'm continuing to test that hypothesis over time. But I'll get back to that. So, I've known Mark for a while, and we invited him to give my crew. Mark, Mark Rosenbaum, for those of you who don't know, is just a terrific uh, engineer, building scientist, uh, good general, general good citizen. And I invited him to, uh, to my company to give my crew a full day workshop 
on how we can move our projects in the right direction, how we can get them to these, this goal that I was slowly realizing uh, was our responsibility to achieve on our, our projects. And I, it wasn't that, basically he said, the only way we're going to be able to achieve the goal we want is, is if we put exterior foam or some sort of exterior insulation on all our projects. Um, and it was a full day workshop, and I argued with him for the full day. Because <laughs> I didn't want to do that. I mean, it's hard to sell that. So finally, at the end of the day, he said, you know, if you're not going to do that, why the hell did you hire me to come here for a full day, basically? And I said, okay, you're right. So um, I was off, you know, I was asked to do major renovation of this house, and I said, we have to put exterior foam on this house. It's pretty simple geometry. It lends itself very well to it. We're not going to do your renovation unless you pay a lot of money to have us put exterior foam on the house, even though you don't want exterior foam on the house. You'd much rather have the really nice bathrooms and the really nice kitchen. And he said, okay, goodbye. Basically, and this was in uh, early 2009. And I didn't get the job, and I had to lay three people off as a result, who, let's just say, they didn't have a whole lot of appreciation for my high moral stance. <laughs> no matter what you do, if you're trying to do the right thing, no matter what you're going to do, someone's going to be unhappy. Just try to make sure it's the right people who are unhappy. Um, bottom line, the, the homeowner was not a client for us. Um, and I, the, the, the big lesson is, was that I really needed to learn how to sell doing the right thing to people. But we'll get into that some more. All right. So we've learned what we have to do with houses to get them to the sort of energy performance that we feel we need to get them to, to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. So we finally get a chance to do a whole enchilada deep energy retrofit. Now, in, this, in the, the world of deep energy retrofits, there's the whole enchiladas and there's the phased. And I'll talk about phased retrofits in a bit because sometimes phased retrofits are the only way you can get them done. But what I'm going to show you is a whole enchilada, and that's where you do everything. And this is a two family in Belmont, Massachusetts. You can see we didn't change the house that much, we changed it a little bit. Architecturally, it was a small step backwards. I think it doesn't have to be, but it was in this case. Um, so they came to me and they said, we want to retrofit this house. We're downsizing. It was, it's a, it was a family, it was the, the state rep and his parents, the state rep's family and, and, and his two parents, who between them had two massive houses. They really wanted to downsize for, for a wide range of reasons. Paramount was environmental reasons. So he said, we're going to buy this wretched old two-family that doesn't have any insulation in it at all. That needs a window, side, and roof, everything. And we're going to, we want to retrofit it to zero net or passive house. So we looked at that a little bit and realized we weren't going to hit those standards. It's, it's really tough to meet those standards on retrofits for, for reasons we can get into during what Q&A if you're interested. So they said, well, OK, well, let's just do a deep energy retrofit. Um, which is the sorts of standards, uh, well, I'll, I'll give back to, to, to exactly what that is. And then, so we developed the budget for the deep energy retrofit, and they said, well, maybe we'll just do the interior renovation. I want to hold off. We want to get our yeah, first score and low to your insulation. So we can the razor bottom, so to speak. And then they thought about it, and, and, and those of you who really sell custom remodeling know uh, this process. It takes a while to get used to the numbers. They mull it, and then eventually they, they often come on board with the, with the magnitude of expenditure. So now the deep energy retrofits back on board. Uh, we signed the contract. Two weeks after we signed the contract, uh, National Grid opens its pilot program to Belmont, Massachusetts. Before it had just been electric, National Grid electric communities. Now it's National Grid electric and gas. Belmont's gas, but not electric with National Grid. So we're eligible for $60,000 in funding. And then 
which brought a tear to my eye and the program administrator's eyes. The homeowner said, wonderful, we're getting $60,000, let's put it on the roof in PV and solar thermal and let's upgrade a few more things. Let's put it into the project. So that was pretty sweet. So we developed, and, and you know, this is not on the test, so you don't have to worry about this too much, but mostly what I want to show you is this was, this was about meeting a goal. This was a goal-oriented project. And, you know, I talked about, I showed that slide of the Cheshire Cat. You know, if you don't know where you're going, anyway, we'll get you there. And, and the need for having a specific target. This was our way of doing a target. This is a her score, and it has its flaws. But basically, And what it, it turned the conversation from, well, what's cost effective to do from an energy performance point of view? That, that was put by the wayside. And the conversation became, what's the most cost effective way to get to a HERS of 32, which is where we ended up. It says 42. There. What's the most cost effective way to get to a HERS of 32? And so that was an interesting shift in the conversation. So basically, this is what we, we did. Uh, we, because of headroom issues, we couldn't add insulation to the floor, which means we didn't meet all the requirements in the National Grid Program, which meant the $60,000 incentive was a $57,000 incentive. That's okay. Um, the R20 specs, and then we bumped them up to R40 for reasons that I'll show you in a bit. Above grade walls, R40, which is uh, dense tax cellulose in the cavities, and then four inches of a foil face polyisocyanurate on the outside to get up to R40. Building Science Corporation is their technical advisor, National Grid's technical advisor, so they're the ones who came up with this. R60 roof, which is uh, cellulose in the existing undersized rafters and then six inches of polyiso on the roof. You notice what we did up there, and I have a picture of this later, so we, it's called a chainsaw retrofit. That dotted line is the old eave. We just cut it right off so that we could run the foam up and over, which, and then we built a new soffit, a new eave, and, and bolted it on later. That enabled us to get uh, real, really good air tightening, because it's tough to air seal around all those little rafters. You know, one analogy that someone used, it's like the difference between gift wrapping a pitchfork that's not in a box and gift wrapping a pitchfork that's in a box. You're going to do a better job if it's in a box. Um, uh, triple glazed windows. Uh, we uh, the recommendation was that we get it to 750 CFM at 50, which is 0.1 CFM, 50 per square foot of shell area. Uh, so many of you will have no idea what that means, but that's okay. Uh, what that means is a 1.28 air changes at 50. And just for for perspective, the current code, at least the current IECC code, is seven air changes. Joke. Um, and passive house is 0.6. This is much closer to passive house than to COVID. Um, we put in our contract that we would hit 100 CFM at 50, which was a scary thing to do because we never put a performance metric like that in our contract before. We actually hit 590, so that was pretty cool. So it's a very tight house. It's like 0.9 air changes per hour. Um, and then we also put in that we needed to hit a HERS of 55, which is 45% better in code than code. We put that in the contract. We actually hit 32 with the final solar thermal. So this is what we did on this two family. And this is a classic deep energy retrofit as defined by not everybody, but a lot of people. So in the basement, as I say, we didn't insulate the floor, but we did do a really good perimeter drain system. Then we sprayed. Uh, a little bit of closed cell foam on the walls for our uh, for a variety of reasons, primarily moisture management. And then we uh, sheetrocked the walls and then we blew in mineral wool. So, you know, originally we were just supposed to get R40 for the above grade part and R20 below, but we found it was much easier just to get R40 for the whole thing. So R40 basement walls. Um, in the attic and roof, uh, anyway, it's just an empty attic that's now a finished attic, and we had to superinsulate the roof. This gives you a sense of the sky. We had to do a skylight, which are normally uh, questionable from an energy performance point of view. We had to put it over the stairwell to get the code 
uh, headroom, code mandated headroom. So we did triple glazed windows, we taped them to the face of the foam, uh, did a little drainage pan underneath and then sealed it up with tape so the drainage pan became a uh, condensation trough. Uh, an evaporation pan is what we call it now. <laughs> but but that's, that's more technical than I want to get. Um, so we've got, you know, good, the, when the cladding goes on, it's going to deal with 99, 95 to 99% of the water. What water does get behind the cladding is going to get dealt with by the face of the foam and the tapes. There's some controversy about whether tapes are an adequate long-term barrier. Um, you get these great window sills when you do the uh, retrofit because you're deepening the walls. You get these, people love these window sills and if there's a cat in the house and they participate in the design meetings, as they usually do. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever spread blueprints out, yeah. drawings out in a house with cats. The cats. <laughs> so anyway, the cat was a big fan of the deep sills. Um, but I, you know, I. So we've got old window openings that are not square. We've got four inches of foam that we've added to the outside, and we're taking new windows which are square, and we're applying them four inches outside of the out square <coughs> window opening. And we're doing this in a way so that all our trim will line up perfectly. It's a three-person job. Um, it just and it, and it still doesn't work. Uh, so just it's it's not. We've got to find easier ways to do this. But um, the big leakage area was the sill, because at the sill we have this exterior insulation which comes down and then it stops. And then the interior insulation in the basement picks up. So you've got this hiatus or whatever. I, 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 oh. It's like that, that Sidney Harris cartoon where the two scientists are at the blackboard. And there's a whole bunch of formulas here, and a whole bunch of formulas here, and a whole bunch of formulas here. And then in the middle, one of the scientists has written, and then a miracle occurs. <laughs> and the second scientist is saying, I think you need to be a little more rigorous in step two. And so anyway, the sill, a miracle occurs. Um, and, and, or not. And uh, we do a blower door test. The blower door pressurizes the house. We fill the basin with theatrical fog and we find out where the leaks are. It's a great test and I think it should be code mandated as a test. But, uh, and then that's how we were able to get down to 590. So that's the details of the sill. Uh, when you get, we got the total, this is a house, two family house with uh, 5,600 square feet in the end when you include the basement and the attic. And we've got the whole thing down to uh, two and a half tons or so, 28 kV to you, which is you know, the smallest conventional boiler you can buy, gas fired boiler you can buy, is 40 kV to you. Um, so we got a little way down, which gave us a lot of options. So we were able to go through uh, some interesting, interesting machinations with the homeowner. We did have to put in. HRV and, and yes, tomorrow should have a ductwork school because uh, this country does not know how to install ductwork, in particular low volume ductwork for ventilation systems. Um, but we, because we're trying to, th these homeowners are going for the thousand home challenge, which which we can talk about a bit during Q and A, but it's worth looking up. Which means that they really want to bring the energy usage to an absolute minimum. Now, mechanical ventilation uses energy, <clears throat> and it uses a fair amount, but it's kind of a requirement for living and breathing. So we designed it to meet the asterisk standards, but, um, and, and again, not to get too technical, Terry Brennan tells us a pretty good proxy for 15 cubic feet per minute of fresh air per person, which is a good standard that meshes reasonably well with the asterisk standard, is to keep the... Uh, uh, CO2 concentrations inside at around 1,000 p ppm. Now you can tell this was developed, well right now we're at 385 parts per million. It's about two parts per million per year increase. So this is a 30 year old standard, but you get the idea. So we uh, fine tune the ventilation system by going with a CO2 monitor and a data logger and uh, continuing to tweak the runtime until we got a distribution that was right around 1,000 CFM. So we were pretty happy with that. We feel very confident that we're, op we're optimizing the ventilation. So what did this cost? Well, it cost a lot. And we're going to talk about it later. <laughs> <laughs> so um, finally, we got our chance to do the whole enchilada deep energy retrofit, and we learned that we can do it. 
Uh, we also learned that all we lack is the resolve and money. <laughs> so, at least we've identified the issue. It's sort of like uh, data is empowering. This is some, these are some good data. All right, so, in Europe, they, uh, I use Europe in quotes for reasons I'll explain later. In Europe, they've been doing retrofits for longer than we have, deep retrofits for longer than we have. So I was blessed to have a chance this past February and March to go to uh, Saxony, which is part of Germany, and Upper Austria, which is part of Austria, to study their high-performance buildings, including retrofits. And I got to go with uh, um, Chris Benedict, Andy Shapiro, who lives up in Montpelier and has spoken here, and Tom Hartman. Chris Benedict is an architect in New York. Tom Hartman's an architect at Amherst. And there's me in beyond, behind there. So the four of us got to travel around Europe for a while. And we saw, um, like a lot of masonry, these are four families, uh, just to give you an idea of what's in the neighborhood. And here's one that was retrofitted to the outside. A lot of insulation on the outside, stuccoed over, a lot of, you know, a lot of stucco over there. Uh, meets passive house standards, so very, very good. There's a school, energy hog of the school. They, um, there's a uh, panel manufacturer that's literally 500 yards away from the school. So they were able to manufacture these honking big panels and just mount them to the outside. Uh, you can sort of see how the, the panel fits to the outside there. It became, turned this beat up old school into this spectacular school, one of the most beautiful schools I've ever been in, and reduced the heating load by 90% <laughs> by retrofitting it to the outside. Apartment block, there's one of the ones that's been retrofitted with the exterior foam. You can see the um, school, 1970s yeah, you beat up, a PD there. It's got school. a lot of uh, solar thermal on the roof. Because you, you know, 55 units, you go through a lot of hot water. This is one of the units in the neighborhood that hasn't been retrofitted yet, so you get a sense of the before picture. This one's in, in Austria. This one uh, has been retrofitted to the outside, and these used to be open balconies that were never used because it's a busy, dirty street. So they closed in the balconies, increased the square footage by about 10% because they're small apartments, so from like 800 to 880 square feet by closing the balconies. Uh, brought it down to passive house standards, reducing uh, heating energy by, by about 80% and total energy by about 60%. Um, so, <laughs> so, it really was fun. It was a blast. Uh, and we learned a lot. And the carbon footprint of the travel didn't count because it was for NASA. So, <laughs> so anyway, we come back. And think there, let's compare that to what we're doing here, because that was part of the point of the trip. The, the areas where they're doing some really interesting things in particular happen to be areas with climates similar to New England climates. Austria, Germany, uh, Denmark, Sweden. And what they're doing in that sort of vertical Central Europe section there is, is pretty fascinating. So that's Iceland. So in both cases, some really good people trying to do some really important things. I mean, their people are no, their, their best people are no better than our best people, um, which is encouraging. Uh, they have better windows. Night and day, yeah. Absolutely night, gorgeous windows. It was like, we, we went to a building conference with the exhibition floor, and the, the, the phrase window pornography was used more than once. Pick an attribute. Quality. Yep, yes, performance. Okay. Yes, quality. What else? Aesthetics. Yes, aesthetics. What else? Uh, cost. Yeah, no. no. <laughs> Actually, the, the really, a really good window over there costs about as much as a custom size Pella or Marvin here. But what you get with the custom size Pella or Marvin is really pretty mediocre performance. I mean, it's hilarious what they foist on us. Is there anybody from Pella or Marvin? <laughs> I mean, to me, the triple glazed Pella is like a waste of good glass for, for a variety of reasons. Anyway, they have really good ventilation products. But that, I mean, HRV, heat recovery, energy recovery. Some really, really cool things. Um, big difference, we did not see a single 
single family home retrofit there. We saw the large buildings, large masonry structures. We didn't see any small scale wood frame retrofits. And we're doing a little bit of that over here. But most of what I know about is this. And, and we'll talk about the, the ramifications of that. So they have cultural support for long term investments. What I mean by that is that this was true in Austria in particular, but also in Saxony. We would go to these, these businesses um, or these homes or, or talk with these people who had been the, the, the business, like there was a, a, an organic grocery store, passive house grocery store, that the farm and the store had been in the same family for four years, four, four generations. <laughs> the, uh, that panel manufactured three generations. There was a Catholic charity a uh, building that we visited that's doing twice as good as Passive House uh, in terms of energy performance, where the, the current director is the son of the founder and the daughter just joined, you know, with the expectation that she'll be moving up the ranks. Uh, architecture firm, fourth generation architect. So they take the long view. They ex seem to, I don't want to over romanticize this, but my sense is they, they expect more of their buildings there than we expect here. Here we expect them to fuel our economy by being cheap. And I realize that it comes across as more than a little cynical. And, and I, I'm not dissing the United States, because I think we are capable of anything if we put ourselves to it. We just need to start putting ourselves to certain things. But we, we basically fueled 20 years of boom by building disposable housing. And, and now we're paying the piper and we, now we have to figure out what to do with it. We will figure out what to do with it. But it's, it's sort of unfortunate. Um, so they have, both in Germany and in Austria, and also in several of the other countries I talked about, they have you know, top government level encouragement through carrots, which is incentive, soft money, you know, uh, low interest loans, sticks, code requirements, and then tambourines, which, are, which is education, marketing and education. Um, and it's all, you know, it's, they, they can get away with that uh, over there. We, it would never fly here. For, for a variety of reasons, some, some good, some bad. But, so what we have here is a mix, very mixed bag of state level, level initiatives, which means it's hard for the national window brands to gain traction with good windows. Because, you know, they're, you know, over there, you pretty much know what's going to be expected anywhere in the country. Here, not, not so much. Um, there, every person we talked to who was in design, engineering, or construction knew what energy standard they were Partly because the incentives are based on energy standard. You know, it's, it's heating energy, so it's like you know, 15 kilowatt hours per square meter is the passive house, and that's, you get the biggest incentive for 25 kilowatt hours, of 35 kilowatt hours, and then 56 kilowatt hours is basically code minimum. But they all knew exactly how much energy a building should use, what they were designing to. Here we have no clue. I mean, you could ask nine. If 9 out of 10, if not 99 out of 100 contractors would not be able to tell you what the anticipated energy usage of a project they're working on was. Um, and then finally, they have really not, you know, just beyond the retrofits, they have very high expectations for new construction. And we have lead. So, <laughs> I worked so hard on my intonation. <laughs> and we have lead. Uh, so, uh, this, uh, just to show you, just to make a stark contrast, here's a single family home we did a major retrofit on. This is, uh, although the shadows on it, this roof slope faces due south. It's terrific solar aperture. Um, and there's a bunch of uh, garbage trees in front of it. So it's what we call a phase transition from biomass to solar. <laughs> So uh, that's how you sell these things to the Conservation Commission. <laughs> um, so anyway, this is, uh, we've gotten the, uh, the peak load of this house down to less than a ton, so we'll be able to get it with uh, heat pumps. It's a, it's a net zero energy potential. Here's a three family that we're, we're doing the, you know, the, the exterior foam on. So this is small scale wood frame construction. And then um, the, uh, the, the woman who owns this house, also owns one of, this is, these are three, these, these are individual entries, each entry has three units. She owns one of the, one of the entryways, so she owns three, a, a vertical stack of three apartments. And she would like to do this, 
to this. Just for one, you know, it doesn't really work, right? Because, uh, well, for a wide variety. <laughs> but if you could wrap this whole structure in insulation, you've got the flat roof. Um, it's, you could turn this whole building into a net energy producer with the right amount of PV. You could reduce the load dramatically by wrapping it as a block, replacing like what they were doing in Europe, right? Um, but we can't do that here. Or it's hard to do that here. We can't do it yet, but we will be able to do it because we've got individual owners, which are hard to coordinate, because we've got the brick facade, which people don't like to cover up. And it's really, really difficult to get a high level of performance by retrofitting these buildings to the inside. And it's also uncertain what you're doing to the brick at that point. Because all of a sudden the brick is, is cold for longer periods. We, however, so you know, uh, we can't retrofit. <clears throat> people, people don't like it when you cover up brick because they love brick. But, and, and, and the preservation community feels quite adamant about this. But what I would like to propose is that if you wrap this with foam, uh, you know, four inches of foam, you screw it through into the mortar, not into the brick. You stucco over it, and then you hire underemployed artists to do a faux brick finish on it, to reproduce all that detail. And you archive it. You're archiving this building until we figure out what to do about the environmental crisis and the, the potential looming energy crisis. So, so 50, 100 years, we've got it stored <laughs> under foam. We solve the problems, and we take the foam off, and we've got an impeccably preserved building underneath. So, we are, can, and do learn a lot by retrofitting the small wood frame structures, but we can't only retrofit the small wood frame structures because it's a drop in the bucket. All right, so, <clears throat> a lot of what you think about deep energy retrofits is determined by what you think about the future. And so it's determined by the quality of your crystal ball. So I have a couple choices here. Looks like a pretty good one. Looks like a good choice there. Um, and I want to talk about discount rate. And I, uh, I love Scientific American. Uh, friends of mine who are scientists love it because it's been dumbed down so much over the years. But it's been dumbed down enough where I can understand it. So I'm happy with the dumbing down. But uh, three years ago, they did an article on discount rate, which basically, just to, just to summarize, uh, it's how much do, uh, what sort of investment now to head off what sort of problem later is it worth making? And that's determined by what discount rate. So let, let me just get specific. Uh, Nicholas Stern of the Stern Report picks a discount rate of 1.4% and says that it's worth investing $247 billion now to head off a trillion dollars of environmental damage 100 years from today. So he puts a high value on future generations. William Nordhaus, who is also a very good economist, picks a discount rate of 6%. And that means that he thinks it's worth investing $2.5 billion now. So two orders of magnitude of difference there. Um, two very different discount rates. So I want to, this is home, literally and figuratively, because I'm going to talk about costs for this project. This is that Belmont project. And it cost, the energy improvement components there cost $258,000. Um, and the assumptions include a 4.5%. 2.5% discount rate, which we'll talk about. 75-year life of the insulation, 3% energy inflation over core inflation, $350 societal cost per ton of carbon. And I can send you this spreadsheet. You can play around with the assumptions. But basically, he's with those assumptions, bing, 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 
that 258, the net present value of that $258,000 is $134,000. So that's why we call it not a very good investment. This, this number needs to be higher than that number for a good investment. So let's, the, this homeowner picked 4.25% as a discount rate. Let's just compare them. So we use Nicholas Stern's 1.6, and that $258,000 investment is worth three times that much. Looks pretty, pretty darn good. William Nordhaus, it looks even worse. It looks really, really bad. Uh, the Belmont client's number, and admittedly, all of these are somewhat arbitrary. It's, it, it's what I showed you before, or very close to what I showed you before. So, um, uh, lousy investment. So, Again, not to, to get too technical, but I just I do need to put this out there because um, the you know this the, the topic of the title of this lecture is passing fat or new reality, and whether they're passing fat or new reality fundamentally is determined by how much do we care about future generations, and uh, it's a hard way to put the question. You know, it's it's an, it's almost an impossible way to put the question. Um, but it is, the, I mean, it is, there's no getting around the fact that how, what you think about investing this much money in existing houses tells us how, what you think about future generations. So that's, uh, now comes the uplifting part, sort of. So what we've got so far, just to, just to recap before I, I go into my um, last points, my last story, story number 10, and then we can have Q&A. Um, so, in my opinion, uh, climate, anthropogenic, you know, human-caused climate change is real. Uh, in my opinion, it's the consequences are coming on us faster and more furious than most people predicted. I think the, the climate scientists I know whom I talk to are really, really worried but they have a hard time communicating that to the public because the public pushes back. But um, I do believe we need to deep retrofit our existing buildings. You know, buildings represent about 40% of our greenhouse gas emissions. It's about half commercial, half residential. So I think we need to do that. I also think that, I know, because I'm trying to sell these, trying to do these, trying to base part of my business on doing deep energy retrofits. I know they're a really hard sell because they are out of reach of 97% of the population. They are something for a well-heeled crusader who can choose between the deep energy retrofit or the luxury kitchen and bathroom. Uh, most of us can't do either. But those who can choose, you know, do have the resources to do one or the other. We need to encourage them, to, I think, to do the deep energy retrofit. What I tell people is in 20 years, that luxury kitchen is going to look like a 20-year-old kitchen. But that deep energy retrofit is, is going to look like money in the bank, potentially. So, um, as I said, even if we can justify them, most people just can't afford them, even with the generous incentives from National Grid. Thus, we need to do something we probably can't afford to do. And how disempowering is that? And that is one thing that I worry about with these deep energy retrofits, is the message they send to people who are really concerned, who want to know what to do, who see these deep energy retrofits and think, boy, if that's, if that's what I have to do, then forget it. I'm going to hang it up right now. So here's what I want to put out there. Um, this, my wife is from Sweden, and uh, when she came over to marry me, her uh, parents gave me this series by Wilhelm Mulder, which is four books long. And I got it, and I smiled politely and thanked them and said, when am I going to time to read four books in a row? So I, I started it to begin, and two weeks later I was done with all four books. They were just so riveting. But it's a story of people... Carl Oscar and Christina, who emigrate from uh, uh, Småland in Sweden to uh, a place just east of the Twin Cities. And uh, this is a reproduction of their house. This is a statue of them in, in Minnesota. You can't tell because of the slide reproduction. But Carl Oscar is looking ahead. Christina is looking back to Sweden. 
Um, these people took a real gamble. I mean, they didn't have a very good where they was where they were. It was a it was a lousy part of Sweden to try to farm them. They just were not making it. So they made a massive sacrifice and went across the ocean in a story really well told and and up the rivers and eventually made it to Minnesota and had a hell of a life. And Christina never liked it. She kept looking back. But Carl Oscar was able to adapt eventually. Uh, and their grandkids and great-grandkids just did spectacularly well. And so you ask them, was it worth it? And uh, my guess is if you could bring them back and ask them that, they would say yes. Even gazing on the Mall of America in Minneapolis, they would probably say yes. So these people took, and I think most people who, who most immigrants, if we could bring them back to life, would say, was it worth it? Look what we have. Was it worth it? They would say yes. So I think we need to we need to get back into that. I mean, that is what found that spirit is what founded the country. Um, the willingness to forego present comfort for future good, and that's really what we're talking about. I think. So, what I would like to propose is that. With regard to our existing homes, our existing buildings, that architects, remodelers, uh, people in the trades, homeowners, as they, as they look at their houses, take the long view. And, and we'll do a little exercise about this. Uh, look at your house. What will this house look like in 2050 if it's going to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem? So put together, uh, you know, how will it handle potentially growing energy price stability? Although one of my bigger fears is that we continue to find cheap sources of fossil fuels, which is quite possible. Um, how will it handle uh, increasingly unpredictable weather? And there's some interesting synergies between a deep energy retrofit uh, and a more resilient house in, in extreme weather events. Some, some synergies. Develop a 40 year plan for the house, get it to 2050. That starts in 2050 and works backwards. So that 2050 plan, that 40 year plan is a 2050 plan. Do as much of the plan as the budget allows. If you can't meet your standards on part of the house, just leave that part of the house alone. Forego the, the instant gratification. Um, when finances recover or when the system or, or part of the house fails, then deal with that. You know, but fit it into the plan. And then eventually, the house will be in the 21st century. And hopefully, it's still the 21st century when you got that far. Um, and, and as I say, along the way, be careful about sending disempowering messages. Every no to one thing needs to be a yes to another. No, we're not going to do that addition because your house is already big enough. But we're going to make sure that because we're not adding extra square footage that needs to be heated, cooled, cleaned, and maintained, we have some more money to put into high quality finishes and better space planning. So we make better use of what you've got. It's going to be more robust and more resilient. So. So think of this, the 40-year plan, and let's, let's just uh, look at these. This is a very large Victorian with turrets, wraparound porch, bays, complex roof. It's, got, it's on a bit of a slope, so it has high, high ceilings in the basement. It's about a one-mile walk from a, 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 a subway stop, T-stop, in, in a suburb of Boston. Um, single family home. This is a Greek revival from the 1840s. It's in a historic district. Literally 15 feet away is a bike path um, that takes you to, again, a major transportation hub. It's got good orientation. This uh, slope faces due south. Um, this is a slab on grade, 1,100 square foot slab on grade ranch. In, uh, it's, it's near public trans sporadic public transportation, but it's within a, 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 a two miles of a, a city center and a shopping, shopping area. This is a McMansion from 2000 that is a half hour drive from any sort of public transportation or, or services that was built without, without uh, the, um, 
there's no building paper under much of the clapboards for some reason. The clapboards are applied directly to the plywood sheathing. The plywood sheathing is taking on water, and there's there's it's not it, it, it's a uh, it, I guess it's poorly built. So it's like a, currently a 1.4 million dollar house that's uh, poorly built. It's a mediocre energy performance. It's about 50 kBTU per square foot per year. So I mean it's okay, not great. So in 40 years, what's going to happen with this house? It'll still be there. It'll still be there. Will it, will it have been wrapped with insulation? No. Good. Summer house. Summer house. <laughs> <laughs> or it'll have, I predict it'll have a super insulated roof and a super insulated basement. Because if you get those, you can make a pretty good, you can make a pretty good reduction. What do you think about the occupancy? Is it going to be a single family home in 40 years? No. No. It's a terrific opportunity to split this up into uh, you know, three or four apartments. A great way to reduce the carbon footprint of a house is to think of carbon footprint per person. So, you know, that house, that brick house where we increase the amperage from 100 to 400, we could have rented the basement out to a family of five, say, and had a net gain there. So, so, um, so I think, so here something, something we can do is make sure that when we renovate this, that we do pay attention to super insulating the roof and the basement where we can. That we do put in services that can be split up. That, you know, we basically, whatever we do, we don't make it hard to turn it into a four family. So we think about that um, as, as we renovate it. And maybe we even spend a little bit of time putting together a plan that shows this as a four family so that anything we can do fit into that plan. And then we advocate for loosened zoning laws. So how about this one? Greek Revival, 1840s, historic district down a bike path. What do you think? Is it going to get wrapped with insulation? It might. This is a very simple geometry. You could wrap this with insulation and make it look exactly the way it does now, only a little bit bigger. <laughs> You know, I love these simple geometries like that. It's got, um, right now, uh, in Massachusetts, there's part of the zoning code. Well, basically, historic district commissions do not have to, um, can do whatever they want, sort of. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of historic preservation, don't get me wrong, but you, you, they would be able to disallow you from putting PV on the roof. And I think that has to change, because PV is reversible. Um, and I think this could be retrofitted and, and PV put on. I think this could stay a single family home. It wouldn't have to, but it could stay a single family home. And it could get pretty close to net zero with the right occupant behavior. So I think it's certainly going to be here. So what about this one? Is, this, is that going to be there? Slide on grade ranch, 1,100 square feet in a fairly, fairly wealthy suburb, but at some distance from, from services. Is that going to be there in 40 years? It's, uh, it's probably going to be torn down and replaced, and hopefully it's replaced with something that's super efficient and, and is maybe multifamily. Um, what about this? Is it going to be there in 50 years? Compost. <laughs> it might be. I mean, it might be that we just, we say, okay, let's live in this as long as it supports life. <laughs> and then abandon it. Because it's just not worth it. You know, it's, it's, you split it up. You split it up into multiple units, and, and, and you've, gained, you haven't, you've gained a lot of cars on the road. You know, maybe it works. I don't know. Um, I, I'm not optimistic about this one, unfortunately, in 40 years. But uh, I could be wrong. So I think, you know, I picked these at random from, from houses that I've been asked to work on. But, but what we do when we take on a project is we think, what is this house going to look like in 2050 if it's going to be part of the solution or the part of the problem? And, and we, we work with the homeowner, and some homeowners say, eh, I don't think so. And we get fired, but that's okay. I, I, I'm, that gives us more time. I'm, you know, saying no to one thing allows us to say yes to others. So we can say yes. We've got more time to say yes to the people who, who buy into what we're saying. Um, so we've taking this a little bit farther, 
this idea of being part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And, and we talk about deep energy retrofit, but it's really a deep resource retrofit. So how can we how can we be better stewards of resources in general, all resources? So we have we have developed a line, are developing a line in the sand, so that we know what we can say yes to and what we can say no to. And uh, one of our senses is that I think, in my opinion, the United States has enough square footage. Um, we just need to be, make better square footage or better use of the square footage that we have. I feel, I feel like um, the idea of green construction is a little bit laughable um, because to me a uh, home, a house, is about as unnatural uh, an endeavor as you can get. We expect it to be warm when it's cold outside, we expect it to be cool when it's hot outside, we expect it to be light when it's dark outside. Sometimes we expect it to be dark when it's light outside, we expect it to be dry when it's wet outside. We only want to share it with uh, four or five of the billions of species in this world. Uh, maybe five or six if you include gerbils. Um, we, uh, we create lawns so that we can keep nature at bay. Um, and I think, most tellingly, uh, the, the, the greatest regenerative force in nature is rot and decay. Rot and decay in a house is the surest sign that somebody has done something wrong. So we take this endeavor and we say, we're going to be green about it. I say, push. The, the only green approach to me is that our buildings be as few and as small and as efficient as possible. So I realize that's not necessarily view shared widely. Uh, but I want to put that out there. So that's our line in the sand, no new construction. And not only that, we think 500 square feet per person is enough. So if you have four people in your house and it's 2,000 square feet and you really want an addition, you don't hire us. Um, we realize that we can't reduce, some houses, if we reduce that energy load by 10%, we're doing really well. Some we shouldn't settle less for less than 40%, uh, 80%. So we need to look at it as a portfolio of projects, and we're going to reduce. Uh, we need to make sure that our portfolio over time moves that in that direction. We think 36 gallons per person per day of water usage is enough. Uh, these are hypotheses, so I'm, I'm open to arguments on these. Um, uh, we want to quantify durability so that we can be accountable. If you don't put a number out there, you can't be held accountable. Um, so we say we're green, what does that mean in a way that can be measured? Uh, and we're still working on this, but we think, for instance, on wood that you should be able to get 20 years out of a paint job, and that you should certainly be able to design and install a roof that lasts 50 years, and that's with asphalt, which I hate as a material, but we're stuck with it. So, and, and, and this list goes on quite a while, quite, quite a ways, but those are just some examples. Because replacement and repair uses resources. Um, we have specific, are developing specific air quality guidelines. One line in the sand is absolutely no VOCs introduced into the house, uh, although then it becomes a definition of what's a VOC. Um, and then we want to make sure that we've got 15 CFM per person. Again, hypothesis. We're still playing with this and then minim minimize job site waste, which is really, really hard to quantify and, and measure at the moment. But it's, it's out there something that we're trying to develop because the, you know, the waste stream is a pretty serious uh, waste of resources. I was thrilled to hear that yesterday was having has a class on uh, what's it called creative deconstruction. deconstruction. Yeah. So we've started off with this idea of a deep energy retrofit. Realized it's grossly impractical at some level, and decided to make it even more impractical. Um, by drawing this line in the sand. But um, our clients are buying it. They're, I think they're understanding that a lot of what has passed for green construction is fundamentally <coughs> meaningless or hasn't gotten us anywhere important. 
And so when I present them with real numbers and real reasons behind those numbers, they can argue with the numbers. Sometimes they can argue with the reasons, but it's an intelligent conversation that is, I feel, getting us somewhere. So um, deep energy retrofit, passing fat or new reality, I think it has to be a new reality. But I, I think the concept, it, it's a concept that needs to be implemented over time by adhering to these rules for every one of our remodeling projects. We are, in essence, doing a deep energy retrofit, a deep resource usage reduction effort. But we're doing it in a way that is accessible for pretty much any homeowner. And, and, and I think we are, um, I feel like we're on to something here. If I'm still in business in two years, I'll know we're on to something. But um, I, I, I just I want to put this out here partly so you argue with it. Um, but partly just because uh, I, I want to communicate where we as remodeling contractors are and how we're trying to respond to, to the challenges. I can change the world with my own two hands, make a better place with my own.